Simeon confined and just silenced in prison. The top three sons, minus Levi, the, the third one. So Reuben, firstborn, Simeon, secondborn, Judah, fourthborn, all got brought to task as if to lay the example down that they were the most accountable or culpable in the situation. And then so, because as they go, the rest of them follow. And you could see that he wanted them to not just be forgiven. He could have done that like that, did it? See, the lesson here is not to forgive folks freely and no, 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 no. Be willing to forgive freely. But, but as I'm always asked by Sister Pam and others, hey, how do you know someone's being genuine, right? Because they can obviously fake it, right? And say feigned hollow words just to get you off their back. Or it's easy for them to who made you the victim to go, oh, come on, get over it. No, 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 no. I, I know that you are, <laughs> you are in a position to experience forgiveness when you have a brokenness about yourself and you recognize your accountability and your culpability. That's what Reuben did. That's what Simeon did. That's what Judah did. And that is important to not overlook. You have to recognize your accountability, culpability. You have to be broken. You have to be silenced. And the, and, the, and, and the truth is what it is. And you're confounded by that. And in Joseph's case, he was rolling from point one through that process to give them forgiveness. He didn't want them to experience it until after they first experienced their accountability and their brokenness and their confoundness before God to own their actions. And then he gave them what he already was predisposed to give to them. They allowed them to experience forgiveness in God's will. That's what forgiveness should look like. Not just freely given. It's like love. Like when you love somebody. You say, I love people. I'm in a disposition to love you. But the love that comes in that full love, which has trust involved with it, doesn't mean I trust you out of the gate. You have to earn that. I don't know if I can trust you. As a person I've never met before in my life, I meet you for the first time. I'm going to extend loving kindness to you, but I don't know if I can trust you, right? So you have to have people earn that, right? So forgiveness is something that you always have to have that disposition of giving it, but you release it onto people when they have God has shown you in their life that they've become accountable. They've become confounded in Simeon's example. They've become broken in Judah's example. You see this, right? Reuben shows accountability. Simeon, confoundedness, silence, Judah, brokenness, no more excuses, no more narratives. They're just, they're just owning it. And they own it to the depth of their heart, right? And then you can say, okay, now I can see God has caused them to be in a position of receiving forgiveness. You see, that's the story there. But, interesting to note, even though they're in the right place, Joseph gave them forgiveness. 17 years later, dad dies, and they think, here he comes now. He's going to come get us. Joseph's like, no, I'm not. It's not like that. Which proves, once again, it's always, it's always the ones who cause the harm who always act like it's, it's you who's the, who's the problem. The ones who cause the harm, the ones who cause the pain, the ones who, the ones who sin against you are the ones who quickly to point a finger. Joseph didn't do anything wrong. It's their own self-conscious, their own guilt eating away at them. He didn't make them feel that way. They felt that way. That's their own sin finding them out. Then that means that they haven't let it, they still had not worked through all of the things that they were supposed to do post-forgiveness. That means they did not cultivate a relationship with him, did it? If they did, I'm sorry, I hate to say this, but the problem is his, his, his brothers, minus Benjamin, did not cultivate and develop a relationship with him, which is why they felt the way they felt, which is evidence, by the way, of people in Christ. And we're gonna end with this because that's what that story was about. So you come to Christ, you're forgiven. And then all of a sudden, if you don't cultivate and develop a relationship with Christ, then later on when death comes, how are you gonna feel then? You're gonna feel like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Well now, the buffer is gone. My dad's gone. The buffer now that's gone is that you can always entertain yourself or distract yourself from reality. But when the physical flesh is, is done away with and you're before God Almighty at the beam of seat, there's no more distractions, is there? No more fun and jokes, is there? No more, ah! There's no more of that. Now it's come to Jesus' time, literally. Now, now, now what's going to happen? Now are you going to be, oh, oh, no, he never did forgive me. Look, he looks kind of mean. He looks kind of like, no, he forgave you. You look at him as me, that's that's your fault. 
if he looks mean to you at that time, or he looks like he's going to do judgment to you at that time, you own that. That's not him. He's there to give peaceful rewards or unfortunate consequences to people. Your life and your lack of cultivating and developing relationship with him is going to determine how you will experience the behemoth If you cultivate and develop relationship with Christ post-forgiveness, then you will not have a fear of him harboring some ills against you. And that's what, even though I sometimes have in the past, and I, I struggle with that sometimes, Joseph's story reminds me that Joseph is a human that typifies the greater grandeur of Christ who once he forgives us, it's real. And as long as we continue to develop and cultivate a relationship with him, we can be at peace even when the buffers are stripped away. In this case, their father represents life and death. When life and its elements are stripped away and we're just left between us and God, <laughs> how do I feel then? Do I still feel forgiven? And the depth of your forgiveness will be felt in the depth of your ability to know that you've cultivated and developed a relationship with Christ, with time spent with him. And I can tell you the reason they felt that way, that means they didn't do that with their brother Joseph, which is very sad. After all they've been through, after all they did, but by the way, were they still blessed? Yep. Were they still loved by Joseph? Yep. But did they miss out on the chance to understand all those 17 years, the greater depth of relationship they could have had? Yes. Which speaks to people in Christ who think it's just good enough to know who Jesus is. And it's good enough to, to die one day and know that you're his child. If that's all you want to do, that's fine. I want to actually please him. I want the most he has for me. That's what I want. I want the most, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. I want the most that, that, that to understand him more, to serve him more, and to have whatever he has in his blessings and benefits. I don't want just the minimum. I want the maximum blessing and benefit of him and whatever he wants to give unto me. I'm, that's what I want. That's what I want. I don't want just enough to be okay with God loving me when I know that he tells me there's more. When there's more, that he offers, then I'm going to take that. I want that. I want to seek that. I want to desire that. I want to strive for that. And that's what Joseph was offering to them. Not just food, provision for the immediate sustainability, but ongoing reconciliation to put the past behind us and let's build a family together. And 10 of them said, no. Just him and Benjamin and their daddy, of course, were good, it seems like. So we're going to end there and keep that in mind and We'll go through a wrap-up of this on on um, on Friday and continue on in our, in our lessons. So let's close now and prepare for our communion we're going to have today. Again, if you don't have your elements ready, get your elements there for communion today. So we pray. Father, thank you for this story again, the understanding of the, the unfolding of what you've done in the book of Genesis and this, the life of Joseph and the story of his brethren and all the things that you continue to show, guide, direct, and help us understand the love that is ours, the forgiveness that is ours in you, but not just that, but what we do with that. Help us to cultivate a loving relationship with you through obedience. Help us to cultivate and develop the appreciation for the forgiveness by forgiving others and being at peace with the relationship we have with you. Help us to gain the, the most of you and understanding of who you are and what you have written to us. Help us to be pleasing in your eyes as your children, as your servants, as you are our doting Father and our ever-loving Savior, our coming bridegroom. So Father, we thank you for all these things and we ask for your guidance, protection, and continue to guide us now to this remembrance of your last supper. We thank you and ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. So we're going to turn now to, um, to the communion. Babe? Babe? Yeah. Laney said his brothers lived all those years maintaining that lie that Joseph was dead. That is so grievous. Yep. Yep. All right, so we're going to be getting ready for our uh, communion time today. So we're going to turn, as our tradition is, to 1 Corinthians 11 and read what the Apostle Paul was instructed uh, to write to us. So 1 Corinthians 11 in verse 23 he says Paul writes for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord on the night in which he was delivered up to the loaf 
having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is that body of mine which is broken on your behalf. This do you for my remembrance. In like manner also the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you may drink for my remembrance. For as often as you may eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the death of the Lord until he come. So whoever may eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord unworthily will be an offender against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he eats and drinks judgment to himself, who eats and drinks, not discriminating the body. For this many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. If, however, we examine ourselves, we should not be judged. But being judged by the Lord, we are corrected, so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my beloved, for my brethren, excuse me, on coming together to eat, cordially receive each other. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, that you may not come together for judgment. And the other matters I will arrange when I come. So Holy Spirit always reminds Paul to remind us to always introspection of ourselves, preparing ourselves to not be an offender at this time. So let us take that moment of silence, be penitent before God, and our consciences and our spirits cleanse before him and before we partake. So we'll take a moment of silence, I'll end this in prayer. confess my sense to you of frustrations and patience with my thoughts and words and deeds that are not becoming of pleasing you. Thank you for your forgiveness and as you continue to purge and restore and refresh and renew heart, mind, soul, spirit. Father, may us all continue to seek you and see your hand in our life, guiding and directing. Looking forward to grabbing hold of your hand and not resisting whatever that path you lead us through, whether it be times of trouble and heartache and pain and misery, that knowing that we're with you that makes it all better. Knowing that the end of it all being used to benefit us and glorify your purpose, your name, to bring us to a place of deeper understanding, deeper walk, deeper faith with you and your word. We thank you for that. So this now as we reconcile back to this time as well, not only in our hearts now preparing for this time of memory, but in the memory of knowing what had happened that day. You were asking so much of them at that time in that emotional and mental state to see with their spiritual eyes and hear with their spiritual ears what you were saying and doing. To help us do likewise, Father, as our Savior and prophet and priest and king, we thank you for who you are and were and are yet to be seen to us and known to us. We thank you so much. We ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. So that night, Jesus, uh, he took the bread and he said, you know, this is his body that was broken, so we're going to pray. Father, thank you for this time of remembering this Passover symbol of you, the Paschal Lamb, whose body would be broken before all your people that did not understand or want or desire to even receive you at this time. So much time and times of love and endearment followed by this hate and malice and indifference to eliminate you off the landscape, to hurt you, punish you, inflict injury upon you unto death. And yet you did this all willingly. And no authority was over you, but you placed that authority to that position to give your life for us as our sin offering. So we thank you for this broken body. It represents your brokenness for us as we are indebted to break ourselves before you constantly, giving of ourselves as you have given to us with humility, with obedience, 
with faithfulness unto death. We thank you in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. up he took a loaf he broke it he said this is that body of mine which is broken on your behalf this do you for my remembrance let's break I always think about this time is when Judas was going to betray him and he said what you must do do quickly and he said in that very moment God was glorified. And then he turned to this cup and lifted this up as a New Testament in his blood. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect, recall, reimagine the love that you had for these disciples and knowing that in time, just three days later, not only would you rise from the dead, but you would give them peace from their fear, from their timidity, from their anxiety, from their hurt and shame. And restore to them a confidence, and you would later give them the power of the Spirit within them to live by faith, in faith, out of faith, pleasing, seeking you. May we too partake of this representation of your testament, of your blood, to be partake of your body and your blood, to be a part with you, to abide with you, to constantly, ever abiding, dwell in your spirit of love and truth. We ask this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. took this uh, cup and did like a marriage vow to them to my life for yours in essence to say this covenant in my blood which makes it a testament this do you my remembrance as often as you drink the cup eat of the bread we declare his death till he come so may he come quickly Lord Jesus knowing that time is short but may the delays be opportunity for us to get more cleaned up and right in our life to please him may we partake in Jesus name And then they went out and sung their Hallel, their multitude of songs, and we sing our song, Let's to be the tie that, tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Bless me. Thank you that our uh, first opportunity to worship in this new facility is a communion Sunday. Be with us as we go forth this week. And we thank you for the mercies that you grant us and that there are professionals that can help us when we have uh, issues like my dental issues last week. And I'm so thankful for the skillful hands of the dentist that did the job very well. And I'm thankful for that and that this is a time when the repair could be made or whatever is coming um, through what we're experiencing on earth at this time. Be with us as we go forth this week to minister to others and to show loving kindness and mercy to those whom we can. Amen. 